The wind was very strong. Imagine Hurricane Katrina times 100. It would literally take the ground and just blow the bones away. So that's why there's no dinosaur uh, fossils here in Illinois. First ever flowers bloomed as well, including magnolias. Then we have the Cenozoic landscape of Kankakee, which began after the extinction of the dinosaurs. It was the start of the very last ice age, which we are still currently in. Humans began to inhabit the area, also known as the Paleo-Indians and mammals and birds evolved. Uh, the glaciers advanced, retreated, and periodically. So as you can see here, um, let me go here. So we have some uh, lobes. So this is where the glaciers first started. They were covering the entire state of Illinois. And as we got towards the last part of the, uh, the ice age, the glaciers covered our area here up in the northeast. And as you can see here, we have the lobes. So there was the Lake Michigan lobe, the Signal lobe, and the Lake Erie lobe. So these are glaciers. And glaciers need an outlet for their glacial wet water. So these lobes would glacial melt water out into the Lake Chicago, which is now um, one of the Great Lakes. And it would go down into the Kankakee River and was held back by one of the moraines over here. So the Kankakee Torrent, this is what shaped our land today. The Kankakee Torrent was a catastrophic bit, uh, flood that occurred 15,500 years ago during the Pleistocene epoch of the Cenozoic era. Three glacial lobes drained through the Kankakee Valley due to lack of outlets, and water broke through the Valsboro Moraine, washing out the Kankakee Basin. So this was waves like a tsunami, but 10 times more powerful than a regular tsunami. The waves were at least 180 feet tall. The water broke pieces of bedrock off, forming giant boulders, and these boulders were like the sizes of cars. And you can find these boulders here in the Kinkakee Valley today. Um, I have a video from the Peoria Riverfront Museum that explains it a little better than I can, so you can watch that if it wants to work. In a time when immense glaciers took hundreds of thousands of years to shake the Earth's surface, a cataclysmic flood, the Kankakee Torrent, dramatically reshaped the landscape, almost overnight. Vast glaciers advanced and retreated across most of present-day Illinois during the Pleistocene Ice Age. At the end of these glacial cycles, the receding glaciers created enormous amounts of meltwater, forming new river channels and filling old ones with sand and gravel. Meltwater also became trapped behind deposits of rock debris that built up at the edges of the moving glaciers. These deposits, known as moraines, acted like dams, holding back the water and forming glacial lakes. Lake Michigan began as a glacial lake and was 60 feet higher than it is today. Geologists speculate that around 14,000 to 18,000 years ago, part of an immense glacier broke off into a lake in what is now northern Indiana and Illinois causing unimaginable amounts of meltwater to surge out and over the glacial lake shores. The waters broke through the moraines in a torrential flood to form what we now know as the Illinois River Valley. This event is known as the Kankakee Torrent. The front of this raging flood was a wall of water that reached up to 180 feet high. Behind it, Hundreds of thousands of cubic feet of water rushed forward every few seconds, many times more powerful than a tsunami. The flood's energy was so great that it broke off chunks of bedrock and carried huge boulders, debris, and sediment along with it for over 300 miles, far into southern Illinois and southeast Missouri. To Paleo-Indians living in the area at this time, the sight of a towering wall of water and the sound of it deafened roar would have been terrifying. It must have seemed like the end of the world as the water rapidly swallowed the land. Even to us today, such a torrent would look unreal, like something out of a disaster movie. A wall of water so massive, loud, and moving so fast, we would think it could only be created by Hollywood special effects. The raging floodwaters of the Kankakee Torrent flowed westward until they reached the ancient Mississippi River Channel. At this point, near what is now Hennepin, Illinois, the floodwaters turned southward, forming the lower Illinois River Valley. Evidence of the torrent can still be found today, telling the story in the topographical characteristics of the area. 
Starved Rock State Park, located along the Illinois River, has many examples of these geological features. As the surging floodwaters passed through the Starved Rock area, it scoured the riverbed, cutting deeply through the sandstone and other sedimentary rocks as it sculpted towering bluffs and canyons. Scour marks can be found on the canyon walls at 180 feet above the current river level, and elongated ridges of deposited sand and gravel, known as rubble bars, can be seen more than 200 feet above today's river level. South of Peoria, the floodwaters slowed down, depositing large amounts of sand and gravel along the Illinois River floodplain. Had the glaciers continued their slow and steady advance and retreat over many thousands of years, the Illinois River Valley, which has influenced and sustained the people of this area for generations, might never have been formed. But the Kankakee Torrent's tremendous force and speed shaped this entire river valley with its deep canyon walls and fertile floodplain in just a few weeks' time. Many of you probably 
have probably been to this found in the Kinky State Park. Um, it's one mile start to finish, and it's a roughly three hour hike. So the first stop is Horse Thief Cave. So only the only caves in Silurian Age Rock in Illinois can be found along the Kinky River. Horse Thief Cave is the largest, and these caves are formed by groundwater in one of two conditions. So the first condition is normal acidic rain, uh, enhanced by acids and overlying rock designed the dolomite bedrock. So one cool thing that I love about limestone is that if you take hydrochloric acid, also known as muriatic acid, and you pour it onto limestone, the rock will start fizzing and dissolving. So rainwater always has an impurity of hydrochloric acid in it. So when the hydrochloric acid falls through the groundwater and goes through the bedrock, it starts dissolving the limestone. And once it starts percolating underneath the limestone, it eats away at the limestone and creates these cavities. And these cavities need a way out, so they open holes and creating caves. The other way is groundwater circulates over under overlying shale rock, which can operate break through, and it forms a cavity where water was circulating, which is how Horse Thief Cave was formed. Small stack. Um, I'm not sure if you can really see it, but that little bulge right there, that's the small stack. It's formed from erosional patterns of water flow. So the waterfall in the uh, Rock Creek Gorge was here, actually, at one point. Um, and water flows zone, through zones of weakness. So it started flowing on the north end at first, but once the zones of weakness became so weak that there was no more, it started to flow on the other way. And my favorite quote is, Mother Nature has the right to change her mind whenever she feels like it. So if she wants to flow on the north end, she can flow on the south end too if she wants. The clay tent. This was um, my favorite stop in the Rock Creek Gorge um, trip. So the clay pit, it forms as a cavity, much like Horse Thief Cave, but instead of um, just staying in a cave, it fills with sediment, and the sediment becomes clay. And the clay will either erode away or harden into a rock over time. Uh, a freshwater groundwater spring actually flows out of this clay pit, uh, and there was once a rusted iron pipe, possibly from the Iron Age, found a few feet from the cl uh, clay pit. And it was most likely used as a spigot for drinking water by the Paleo Indians or the settlers that came here in the early 1800s. Um, I have a video here and a picture of me collecting water from the clay pit. The water actually flows at a decent rate, and it flows down from the clay pit down uh, the sand bed, I guess you could say, and into the river. So here's, um, I'm messing with the water, but <laughs> the water was actually ice cold, really easy to drink and collect. And um, I believe I show how it goes down into the river. You can see the trail. So the last stop was the small arch. The original arch that was described in the field study guide that I had collapsed. Um, but I found another one. So arches are begin as cavities, much like Horse Thief Cave, but instead of just forming a cave, they form a tunnel. And um, many small cavities, much like the image on the right, can be seen within the walls of Rock Creek Forge. And a lot of them are inhabited by bugs, spiders, and birds. Um, the waterfall. So when I took the trip, the waterfall, the water levels were at the all-time lowest. And it was wonderful to see it because I could see the uh, levels of limestone sediment and uh, bedrock throughout the eras. The Rock Creek flows at a much smaller pace than the Kinky River, uh, causing the gorge to be uh, at a higher elevation. Rock Creek formed the waterfall through trying to become level with the river. So water always wants an output. Rivers go to oceans, lakes go to rivers, which go to oceans. So the Creek Gorge just wants to get to the river, and it's at a higher elevation, and the Pinky Cube River's down here. So what it's going to do is downcut, and by downcutting, it creates waterfalls. And over time, these waterfalls start to erode, and they move upstream. This waterfall actually migrated 0.7 miles upstream over the past 12,000 years. Here's a few pictures I have from the, the trip. Um, you can see how low the water level was. You can see the bottom of the rock creek. That's not usually something that you can see. Um, the picture on the left, your guys' is right. <laughs> so that is underneath the bridge. You can see 
see all of the layers of limestone and dolomite, and I think it's really cool how blocky limestone is, is because each one of those little layers is at least a thousand years of sediment. <coughs>
What's your question? Uh, you talked about how the dual zero can be widened. Yes. I mentioned that that is in response to water volume. Yes, exactly. And what causes the, the change in the water volume? Precipitation. So um, if there's a lot of snow, you're going to get a wider um, flood seasons, basically. So you can tell the flood seasons, how it narrowed and uh, widened the gorge over time. And about how long does it take to it to the mark? Oh, like thousands of years. <laughs> yes. Any other? Yes? So, as I understand it, the torrent created kind of islands or lumps in the landscape. Is there? Is there a difference in composition between those and a moraine? Can you tell the difference between the what? sand sediment? So the um, the outwash actually carried a lot of the sand sediment into the Illinois River, and that's why the Illinois River is the sand river, and then the Kankakee River is the rock river. Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs>